Hey guys, I'm really sorry about the live stream there. We had um, some sort of technical problem. I'm not exactly sure what happened there, but we're live again. Again, this is our Space Family Night where we're going to talk about the anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. So Nick, without further ado, um, go ahead and get started again. Okay, I'm back. We're back. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, so I forget what you may have heard. We'll just go through a, a little bit of the background of the Hubble Space Telescope. Very brief. Look at some awesome photographs from the Hubble and then uh, look at the anniversary pictures that it, they've been releasing for the past 16 years now, including the one released today for the 30th anniversary. And again, if you have any questions at any time, just uh, go ahead and uh, send them to Kyle and we'll answer them uh, as they can come in. So looking at a picture of the Hubble up above the atmosphere of the Earth, that's why it's in space. It's not zipping around to other solar systems, other galaxies. It's just orbiting the Earth. In fact, if you're close enough to the equator, you can see it as a moderately bright satellite uh, when it goes by. But it's about 303, 350 miles up there above the atmosphere, and that gives it a crystal clear view of our universe. So where does the Hubble get its name from? It gets its name from uh, probably the most famous American astronomer uh, in, in the world, and he made two really, really big discoveries, uh, astronomical discoveries in the 20th century, actually in the 1920s. So in the early 1920s, he was able to demonstrate that the Milky Way galaxy is not the entire universe. There was a debate up to that point. Do we live in a galaxy surrounded by nothing but empty space forever? Or do we live in a universe with our galaxy and a bunch of others going out in all directions? And it turns out we live in one galaxy. There's upwards of maybe a couple trillion galaxies in our little observable universe, or little, or really big observable universe. And uh, that picture goes back to, to Hubble and his discoveries in the early 1920s. And following that up, Edwin Hubble discovered that the galaxies are all moving away from each other. He basically discovered the expansion of the universe which eventually led us down to the, the discovery of the, of the origins of the universe, the Big Bang origin of the universe. So that's why the most famous telescope in the world is named after him. He discovered, proved the existence of their galaxies and discovered the expansion of the universe, which is pretty impressive. All right. And he was able to do that, by the way, because he was working with the biggest telescope in the world at the time, which coincidentally is about as big as the Hubble Space Telescope is right now. now of course, the Hubble uh, is much better than the one Edwin Hubble was using because it's up above the atmosphere. And again, you get that crystal clear view without the atmosphere of the Earth distorting the light. So here's a picture of um, um, Mount Wilson Observatory uh, where he worked with that telescope, just uh, actually a little bit bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope today. Um, not as useful as it was back in the day because of it's, it's uh, in the mountains outside of Los Angeles. And so with the growth of Los Angeles over the, uh, over the decades, uh, the sky has gotten brighter and brighter. And so it's had less and less dark skies to, to work with over time. But that's where he made his discoveries in the 1920s. Now who launched the Hubble Space Telescope, the most famous telescope uh, uh, in the world? Well, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. This is the United States government's space agency, which is most famous for putting people on the moon, uh, starting July 20th, 1969 with Apollo 11, uh, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first people to walk on the surface of another world. So there's a picture of Buzz walking on the moon. They do a whole bunch of other stuff, but anyway, that's what they're most famous for. And of course also the Hubble Space Telescope. There is a photograph showing the Discovery Space Shuttle launching from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida back 30 years hey, ago, hey, April hey, Nick. Yeah, we got a question actually, real quick. Uh, Great. So Stella, age two, wants to know why that telescope was stuck in the trees. <laughs> yeah, actually, I picked. The, <laughs> looks like it was launched from the trees. This is a, a photograph taken quite. A ways away uh, and from a perspective where you don't see the, the buildings and stuff from the Kennedy Space Center. I thought it looked the coolest, so I picked that. But there are buildings over there, over the bridge, over the horizon. You just can't see them from this perspective. 
but it makes it look cool because it looks like it's launched just out of the middle of nowhere where you might launch maybe Stella will launch rockets, you know, in, in a cornfield or something uh, in school someday. But that is, uh, yeah, launched from the Kennedy Space Center down in Florida. And there's the following day, April 25th, uh, when they used the Canada Arm, Canada Arm 1, attached to the space shuttle there, which released the Hubble. The Canada Arm 2 right now is, is attached to the International Space Station. And apparently the Canada Arm 3 will be on the, the gateway, the small space station, eventually orbiting the moon, hopefully in the next coming decade. So they're really exciting. And finally I got up there, it actually had been in the works for decades. And after setting it out and taking some pictures, everybody was devastated because as the pictures came back, they realized that instead of getting a crystal clear view of the universe better than anything that we'd ever had before, they were getting fuzzy pictures. There was a flaw there in the, in the mirror of the Hubble Space Telescope. So there was a defect in the mirror and they were unable to take these awesome, better than ever pictures. Um, so really devastating. However, the Hubble, as I said, was launched up uh, just a few hundred miles above the Earth. It was taken up in the space shuttle. It was designed to be um, visited repeatedly by astronauts on the space shuttle to uh, provide upgrades, and in this case, to um, provide repairs. So after they figured out exactly how the mirror was distorted, was distorting the image, they went up over three years later, three and a half years later, and uh, were able to repair the Hubble Space Telescope. And essentially, they didn't do anything to the mirror, but they put in, you can think of them as, as glasses, um, optics to repair the, the, the correct for the distortion in the mirror that uh, then we could start taking crystal clear views of the cosmos. So there you see a comparison from the Hubble Space Telescope 1990 to 1993, and then from 1993 afterwards, uh, much crisper views, better than had ever been taken before. And like I said, it was designed to be regularly um, visited. And there were four other visits by astronauts on space shuttle missions uh, to repair and upgrade the Hubble over the years. The most recent one was in 2009. And almost certainly that'll be the last one. There's no plans or even capability right now to be able to send astronauts up to the Hubble uh, upgraded again. But hopefully, uh, you know, it's been working 30 years so far. Hopefully we'll get another decade out of it at least. That'd be pretty awesome. Um, but I'll talk also, there's a, a new telescope NASA has in the works as well. And there you see on the right, uh, an even crisper view of the center of a, a galaxy taken uh, from the most recent wide field camera three. So the first one, wide field camera one, with nothing but fuzzy pictures, wide field camera two, uh, wide field and planetary camera two, took a bunch of cool pictures for more than a decade. And now we've got wide field camera three that was installed back in 2009. But let's look at some of the most awesome pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope over 30 years. Start close to home. This is our neighbor planet, the red planet Mars. Let me try pointing to some places on Mars. Hopefully you can see my big um, pointer. Point over to the south pole of Mars. You can see white stuff down there. That is uh, the polar ice cap at the south pole. There's another one at the north pole. Frozen water on Mars. It's covered with dry ice during the winter. You can see rusty dust all over the red planet. You can see dark volcanic rocks. You can see a triangular feature up here called Sirtis Major. It's actually a volcano uh, in that region. And just to the right of that is where NASA is going to be landing their next uh, Mars rover, the Perseverance rover, which will be launching to Mars this summer, um, hopefully starting as early as July, I think, 17th. And uh, launch window will be open for a couple of weeks going into August. And then it'll, sometime in July, and if it's, Kyle, do you know the date of that? What is the date of that? The date of? The launch of Perseverance. The launch of Perseverance. Ooh, actually do not know. I want to 
sometime in July. I want to say July 2nd, but I'm not 100%. I know, I know it'll be on the Atlas V rocket, but I know the date is accurate. Um, but it's landing, uh, it's landing February 17th, I'm, I'm pretty sure, next year. And it'll be landing in actually uh, a river delta over there on Mars that's deposited into an ancient lake on Mars. It'll be pretty cool. But anyway, so now uh, the Hubble looks at planets in our solar system. It looks at, here's a cool picture of a comet that disintegrated. This is a, a false color picture. It's important to point out, this is what Mars looks like essentially in real color to the human eye. Um, the Hubble also takes pictures with false color where the colors don't look like what our eyes will actually see. So I'll try to point that out as we go through the pictures. But here's pieces of a comet. This was ex especially exciting because we watched these pieces slam into the biggest planet in the solar system, Jupiter. And this was just shortly after, uh, relatively shortly after the, they fixed the Hubble for the first time and were able to take crisp views of the universe. So there you can see Jupiter and its clouds. I'll point out its great red spot, which is the size of the Earth. It's been raging on Jupiter for at least hundreds of years. Who knows how long? Very dynamic planet. It's all weather. It's all clouds. And here you see some really dark stuff in the clouds that is not usually there. And that is where uh, individual pieces of that comet crashed into Jupiter, releasing tons of energy, energy disintegrating and, and billowing up these clouds of, of dark particles that uh, lasted for weeks, maybe even months before dissipating. So really cool to, to have the Hubble up and running to see that uh, for the first time, comets crashing into another planet. Cool pictures of my favorite planet, Saturn. You can see Saturn and its rings. You can see some moons. The big, biggest one there, the fuzzy orange one, that is Saturn's moon Titan. It's got a fuzzy orange atmosphere. Um, there's there's a shadow being cast onto Saturn's clouds. Nowhere to land on Saturn, but if you could be in that shadow, you'd be seeing a uh, total eclipse of the sun. Um, there's a new, also a new NASA mission going out to Titan. It's gonna, it's not gonna get there for a long, long time, but it's gonna be pretty cool. Called Dragonfly. It's actually gonna fly around. It's gonna be a drone quadcopter flying around the atmosphere of, of Titan. It's not gonna get there till. Uh, now I can't remember, 20, thir the 2030s. It'll be a really long time. Here's another cool picture of Saturn. Notice the different orientation. That's because Saturn is tilted about the same as the Earth. And as it goes around the sun every 30 years, uh, sometimes we see it edge on, sometimes we see it kind of from, from above. It's kind of cool to see the changing perspective of Saturn's rings. All right, let's go out beyond our solar system and look at a place where new solar systems are forming right now. This is a nebula. That's our fancy uh, word for space cloud. So there's all different kinds of space clouds out there. Um, the Orion Nebula is a space cloud at, where the cloud is condensing under gravity into new stars and new planets around those stars. There's over a thousand baby stars inside this cloud. This is actually uh, a natural color. This is about the real color that's coming out of the Orion Nebula. It's mostly hydrogen and the stars are mostly hydrogen and uh, the biggest hottest stars can make it light up and glow. And when hydrogen glows, when it fluoresces, it fluoresces this beautiful purple, pink, magenta color. So that is the real color coming out. Having said that though, you could never see that color with your own eyes, no matter how big of a telescope you look through, or even if you got in a spaceship and you flew 1500 light years away to the Orion Nebula, um, it would just be too, too faint. So our eyes just aren't big enough, but with a long exposure photograph like this with the Hubble, we can see the actual colors that are coming out that we would see if, if our eyes were big enough. And let's look at some of the details in the Hubble. Oh, first of all, there it is in the famous constellation Orion the Hunter. So you can recognize the three stars in Orion's belt. There's the red supergiant Betelgeuse. There's the blue supergiant Rigel. Hanging from the belt of Orion is the sword of Orion. And the fuzzy thing in the middle is the Orion Nebula, which is one of the two star-forming clouds you can actually see 
uh, from Illinois with the naked eye. And you might still be able to see it. Orion's up uh, most of the night in the winter, but uh, still up in the early evening. So if you look out to the, to the west after sunset in the early evening, you can look for the belt of Orion, look below the belt for the sword. You can see the fuzzy glow of the Orion Nebula with the naked eye. If you got your binoculars or telescope, you can tell that it's a wispy space cloud out there. And the whole cloud, by the way, I mentioned there's a thousand baby stars in there. The whole cloud is being lit up just by the four brightest stars sitting in the middle there, the trapezium cluster. Again, if you get out to your binoculars or telescope, you might see those individual four stars, which are the biggest, hottest ones lighting up the whole cloud. Here's a, one of my favorite types of objects. There's a baby star forming. And uh, when stars form, their magnetic force fields, just like the Earth has a magnetic force field, they, their magnetic force fields can send um, jets of blobs of hydrogen and gases shooting out through their North Pole and the South Pole. And it's really cool when they're still inside the nebula because you can see it plowing through the nebula. Here's a, a tremendous jet shooting out of one of the poles and then another jet going out the other way. You can really sense the, the depth in the picture that way, um, the 3D nature there. And here's some close-ups of proplids, protoplanetary disks. So when stars form in these clouds and they form in dozens or hundreds or thousands in the case of the Orion Nebula, uh, they are spinning around. Most of that material falls into the star in the center that's forming. The leftover material makes a disk of dust. And then that disk of dust eventually condenses into planets, moons, comets, asteroids. And here we're seeing that process taking place. We're seeing the leftover clouds of dust surrounding these baby stars. So these are new solar systems in the process of formation, in the process of making new planets around these baby stars. And besides uh, thousands of, of stars, we're also getting what we nickname or call failed stars. So a star needs to be massive enough to actually turn on nuclear fusion in its core. And if it's not massive enough, it, it won't be able to do that. And stars that are kind of bigger than uh, planets, significantly bigger than Jupiter, significantly smaller than the sun, they'll have a little bit of fusion, not the um, regular hydrogen nuclear fusion, um, which is how we define a star. And so what you're seeing here, all these little red dots are brown dwarfs, They're kind of in between the smallest stars and the biggest planets, you can think of them as failed stars, but interesting objects, lots of them in the Orion Nebula. All right, here's uh, one of the most famous iconic pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope called the Pillars of Creation. And again, we're looking at a nebula like the Orion Nebula. Um, so this is the place where stars are forming. There's, these are big hours of dust where stars are forming inside these pillars. Um, the pillars are being eroded away from energetic light and, and blasts of wind from other newborn stars in the nebula. This is a, a false color picture. This is, oh, by the way, let me, yeah, let me address the, the funny shape to it. You may have seen this in a lot of uh, Hubble pictures. They don't take these stair step pictures anymore because this was the old wide field and planetary camera two, which has been replaced by wide field camera three. Um, but the reason for the funny shape is that uh, out of the three detectors there, the fourth one in the upper right was, uh, um, was zoomed in. It had a smaller field of view, higher resolution. And so you'll see when all those four were used in, in the picture, you see the cool stair step there that you see in the pillars of creation. And there you can see where the, the false color comes from. The, we're looking at different gases in the cloud, sulfur, which was colored red, hydrogen, which was colored green in this picture, and oxygen, which was colored blue. The actual color of the nebula is just like the Orion Nebula, magenta, uh, magenta purple, pink, because it's mostly hydrogen. And there you can see where in this nebula these dark pillars of dust where new stars are forming are. It's a, um, the pillars are about, uh, let me see, I got this one. Five, five light years tall. That's a little bit farther away than the distance, a little bit longer than the distance between the sun 
and the nearest star, Proxima Centauri. So this, these are really big clouds. And they're an even bigger cloud of gas with a bunch of stars that have already formed over there in the Eagle Nebula. And that nebula is about 70 light years across. I think it's about uh, 6,000, 6,500 light years away. A little bit bigger than the Orion Nebula, farther away. Uh, I don't think you can, see, I've never seen it with the naked eye, but with binoculars or a telescope. And this is a more recent picture of the pillars of creation uh, taken after uh, upgrading some of the cameras. Uh, so similar color, a uh, little bit longer field of view. You can see them towering. And along with this uh, better, more recent picture, there's also an infrared picture. So this is necessarily false color because infrared is an invisible color of light our eyes cannot see, but the Hubble can see a little bit of. And it uh, you go back and forth. You'll notice the infrared can help us see through the dust in those clouds. Now, in the place where it's thickest, you can't can't see through, but um, but you can see a little bit through. And you can see some of the a lot of the stars through the dust and the gas. So I'll show you some other pictures like this where we have uh, visible light and infrared, and you can see how the infrared gives us a a view through the pillars of of creation there a little bit. All right, we've seen where stars are forming. Here's a place where a star is dying, a sun-like star, not too big. Um, that's a near the end of its life, and it's blown its outer layers of gas out into space. And this is a relatively true representation of the actual colors coming from the different gases that are coming out of the ring nebula. So you can see the dying star in the middle and all this outer layers of clouds flying out and fluoresce, excuse me, uh, fluorescing from the really, really high temperatures of the star in, in the middle. It's, it's about uh, 200,000 degrees hot. For comparison, the sun is about 10,000 degrees hot. So you got a really hot, de dead, dying star stuck in the middle. The cloud of gas is flying away at, at over 50,000 miles per hour. Here's another dying star. This is not a the death of a sun-like star. This is a much more massive star that went supernova uh, a thousand years ago. It was actually seen in the sky after it exploded. When we look there with the Hubble today, we see a tremendous chaotic uh, explosion with gases flying out. Um, this is about 6,500 light years away, it's, uh, six light years across, and it's going expanding outwards more than 3 million miles per hour. So the ring nebula was only 50,000 miles per hour. This is uh, millions of miles per hour. That's what you get the energy from a supernova. And it's nicknamed the Crab Nebula because the first guy who, who <clears throat> uh, drew a picture of it uh, with the biggest telescope in the world in the mid to late 1800s. Uh, there's this picture of it. I guess it looks kind of like a crab. So you look at the Hubble picture, it doesn't look anything like a crab, but I guess some people look like a crab through, through that telescope. And there's a zoom in on uh, the center where we see this is this one right here is the dead star, which again was more massive than the sun, bigger than the sun. Now it has shrunk down to about the size of Peoria, a little bit bigger than Peoria, and is spinning around uh, over 30 times a second. A dead star called a neutron star or a pulsar that sends out pulses of, of light every 30 times every second in the case of, of the crab pulsar. Oh yeah, this is, uh, by the way, we had a, we had a, a contest on our, our a voting on our social media for the best uh, Hubble photographs. This was voted number one, the Sombrero Galaxy. So now we're looking out beyond uh, stars in, forming in our galaxy, stars dying in our galaxy looking out across intergalactic space at another galaxy where you can see the, the dark clouds of dust. We're looking at a pretty much edge on. Beautiful galaxy, about half the size of our Milky Way and about 30 million light years away. So now the, the distance out of the galaxies are out in millions of light years away. And you can see other even more distant galaxies beyond the Sombrero. And by the way, we looked at the Orion Nebula earlier that was voted uh, number three on our online poll. 
All right, now I'll show you my favorite pictures, the, the deepest pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, <clears throat> this picture was taken uh, back in the mid 90s, um, and looking at a little tiny piece of the sky. In fact, if you want to know how tiny it is, take a dime and hold it out at arm's length, close your eye, and the area covered up by Roosevelt's eye is the little tiny piece of the sky that is in this photograph from the Hubble Space Telescope showing about 3,000 galaxies. And this is a 10 day long exposure. So this is just pointing the telescope at an apparently empty region of space for 10 days, letting that faint light come into the uh, telescope and into the camera, and then eventually producing this incredible photograph showing thousands of galaxies stretching billions of light years across space. And after doing that, after doing that picture, they looked in another direction. There's a little tiny piece in the sky. They looked in another direction and took a similar photograph and they saw a similar result uh, um, showing us that the universe looks essentially the same in all directions. There's galaxies all over the place in every direction. Again, probably a couple trillion in our uh, observable universe. And after an upgrade, they took, I'll say this is probably my favorite Hubble uh, picture, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So this is a little bit longer exposure with a better camera showing 10,000 galaxies. And the most distant ones, their light has taken over 13 billion years to get to us. So you're looking out across space, you're looking back across time over 13 billion years ago to see baby galaxies that were first forming in the universe. And now the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, which is just an even longer exposure, 23-day um, exposure, just sitting there looking out and seeing uh, over 5,000, 500 galaxies. This is kind of a little smaller piece of the, of the ultra deep field. And as far as Hubble has been able to look out into space, the next big NASA Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, hopefully launching in 2021. This is how big it's going to be. This is how big its mirror is going to be compared to the Hubble mirror. Hubble mirror is about eight feet across. Um, and the James Webb will be looking into the, a little bit into the infrared. It'll be able to see even farther than Hubble. So here you can see kind of a plot showing how far into space and how deep into time we could look before the Hubble. And then we got the Hubble up and then made improvements to the Hubble and took longer exposures. Well, there's still a, a limit to how far Hubble can see um, with its infrared technology, but the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to see even farther. If we're lucky, it'll be able to see maybe the first stars turning on or, or maybe the first galaxies just, just forming. It'll be able to see farther, farther in time than the Hubble Space Telescope and hopefully launching next year. All right, let's look at, at the, let's finish now by looking at the birthday pictures. So it's the 30th anniversary today. The first 14 anniversaries, they didn't do anything, uh, uh, but starting with the 15th one back in 2005, they started releasing special aesthetically pleasing images just to show off how the beautiful pictures that, that Hubble takes. So this is the 15th anniversary picture, one of the two, it's the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's actually two galaxies interacting with each other. And you can see spiral galaxy. You can see all these pink dots along the spiral arms. Each one of those dots is, is like the Orion Nebula or the Eagle Nebula. It's a star forming cloud with dozens or hundreds or thousands of new baby stars forming inside there. And this was, by the way, also uh, uh, drawn by that same guy who drew the picture of the Crab Nebula. Again, he had the biggest telescope in the world. In the mid to late 1800s, there's his cool picture or drawing of the Whirlpool Galaxy. This was also released at the same time. This is another dark cloud of dust in the Eagle Nebula. Again, a false color, different false color than we saw with the pillars of creation. So there you can see there's the pillars of creation we saw earlier, and then another pillar photographed for the 15th anniversary of Hubble over in the Eagle Nebula. And then we have this galaxy for the 16th anniversary, which was uh, voted second in our online survey. It's nicknamed the Cigar Galaxy. 
And that's because if you look at it through a telescope, it'll look like a cigar. It looks like a straight line. There's a, the cigar galaxy not too far away from another galaxy. In fact, they're interacting, which is why you see all these red clouds flying up and down above and below the, the disk of the galaxy. This is hydrogen gas, and it's getting blown away by all the all the thousands, millions of new stars forming rapidly inside that disk and blowing the clouds away. This is what we call a star burst galaxy because there's so many stars forming right now uh, at once. And the result of that is because of the gravitational interaction with that galaxy not too far away, which is causing the clouds to condense rapidly and make new stars. Those are about, uh, they're about 12 million light years away. It's actually pretty, pretty close uh, neighbor galaxies to us. All right, the eight, 17th anniversary, the Carina Nebula, can't see it from Illinois, but uh, it's in the Southern Hemisphere. And this is false color. Again, it's mostly hydrogen. So it's uh, mostly magenta, that the actual light that's coming out. This is an enormous nebula, by the way. Um, it's 7,500 light years away. It's 7,500 light years away, seven times farther away than the Orion Nebula. But this is also visible to the naked eye if you're far enough south. And the reason it's visible is because it's way bigger than the Orion Nebula. It's about uh, 10 times the diameter of the Orion Nebula, just enormous, gargantuan, and all sorts of awesome stuff happening in here. Just zoom in there, you can see cool cluster of stars, a dark pillar of dust, another little dark pillar over there. There's a dark pillar nicknamed the caterpillar. There we can see those jets shooting out of baby stars that have just turned on inside this pillar. There are jets shooting out and some more jets shooting out down here. So that tells us new stars have just formed inside the mystic mountain of the Carina Nebula. All right, the 18th anniversary, just a, a bunch of galaxies, not just galaxies, but interacting galaxies. So each of these pictures is showing galaxies in the process of colliding and merging and eventually forming a larger galaxy, which will be the fate of our Milky Way galaxy once it collides with the Andromeda galaxy in another four or five billion years or so. All right, 19th anniversary picture was ARP-194, that's just a catalog name. I think some guy named ARP. The catalog of galaxies that are interacting. So here you can see, actually a couple, of, there's a galaxy here, a galaxy here. There's a nice bridge of stars being pulled across. Uh, you can even see other galaxies. I don't know, those are probably behind. It looks smaller. You can even see even more distant galaxies not interacting at all. That, by the way, uh, 600 million light years away. For the 20th anniversary, they went back to the Carina Nebula, went back to the Mystic Mountain. And again, here we kind of like we saw with the Pillars of Creation, a larger field of view for the Mystic Mountain. Um, blobs of dust floating around. Oh, yeah. And they took uh, an infrared picture. There we can see through the clouds of dust a little bit. Back and forth for you. Twenty first, another ARP one. So again, interacting galaxies. You can see the spiral arms here. It's starting to get pulled away, maybe towards towards this galaxy, which is also looking a little bit distorted. Um, and as with all these Hubble photos of of galaxies, you can see in the background little little itsy bitsy ones. If you go onto their website and get the high resolution pictures, you can zoom in and see these awesome. You know, oh, Nick, really quick, really quickly, Nick. Um, yeah. ARP stands for Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies. Oh, thank you. OK, so yeah, it's a catalog, not a person named ARP. Thank you, Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies. I wasn't sure either, so. And that I, also, yeah, that also goes back to the fact that they, at the time, they did not know that they were interacting galaxies. They just saw funny shaped galaxies. Now we know they're all interacting, lighting, merging. Here's a scale. I get relatively rep good representation of natural color, roughly. All right, the 22nd anniversary. This is a little bit beyond our galaxy. Our galaxy is 100,000 light years across. 
This is 160,000 light years away. This is one of our satellite galaxies, the Large Magellanic Cloud. And this nebula is even bigger than the Carina Nebula. This is the Tarantula Nebula, false color. There's, a, again, the magenta natural color hydrogen glow. Um, this is also the site of the most recent supernova, the closest uh, supernova since the telescope has been invented. A star exploded there in 1987, but there's, I don't know how many thousands, millions of stars forming in this gigantic cloud. Um, visible if you're in the Southern Hemisphere and you look at the, the clouds of Magellan. And there, zooming out a little bit more, you can, you can see the Magellanic Cloud in the big glowing part that we call the Tarantula Nebula. So this cloud is visible from the Southern Hemisphere. Fuzzy, fuzzy little, looks like a fuzzy piece of the Milky Way. All right, here's another one of my favorites, the 23 Third anniversary, they looked at the horse head nebula. Hopefully you can see the horse head. And this is an infrared picture. So we're seeing the glow, uh, we're seeing through some gas and we're also seeing glow coming from the dust. The dust will glow a little bit in the infrared. The more familiar view of the horse head is as a dark silhouette where the cloud of dust is, is in front of the glowing magenta hydrogen behind it. But the Hubble took this awesome unique view of it showing the clouds. And you can, again, see the real 3D nature of space here. You can see these clouds, um, the depth of, the, of them in the horse head. And this is uh, in our galaxy. This is 1,500 light years away. It's over by the Orion Nebula. Um, you can't see the Orion Nebula in this picture. It's down a little bit further. But you can see the stars of Orion's belt. And right next to the um, easternmost star, you can see the dark silhouette of the Horsehead Nebula. I have not seen it personally. Have you seen it, Kyle, with the telescope? I have. Actually. I have been very fortunate to with a, it's a very, very faint tel uh, object to look at, but if you have what's called a hydrogen beta filter, you can actually be able to see the Horsehead Nebula through a large telescope, and I'm talking a $10,000 telescope. It is very, very faint though, but it is just barely visible. Okay, yeah. So I've tried. I've looked. I don't have that telescope. I've looked, and I didn't. I didn't see it. I didn't think I'd see it. Um, but if you got an awesome telescope, check that out. All right, twenty fourth anniversary. Another, not the horse head, the monkey head. This is a false color. This is another cloud of gas with baby stars forming inside of it. Again, the cloud would be kind of a magenta color. We're just looking at that little tiny region of the monkey head nebula. I guess looks like a monkey head. That's uh, about 6,000 light years away, 50 light years across, so about twice the size of the Orion Nebula. Oh, and I should mention something you can see really dramatically in, in the Hubble picture is that, uh, well, look here first. You can see there's the brightest star there in the Monkey Nebula. It is blowing out uh, gas into the nebula. It's also shining with intense ultraviolet light, and that is eroding the thicker clouds in the nebula. So you can see this is getting blown away, not in, in the Hubble picture, the star is off, off to the side, but you can see the effects of the erosion from the stellar wind and the radiation that's blowing this cloud apart uh, into, into pillars like we saw in the Eagle Nebula and the Carina Nebula. All right, 25th anniversary, another glowing cloud with um, forming stars. Uh, Westerland too. I'm pretty sure this was named after a guy named Westerland. He discovered it. Um, there's a beautiful cluster of stars there and blowing away what's left of the nebulosity. And again, you can see the dark uh, pillars kind of pointing towards the stars that are blowing them apart. Kind of zoom out a little bit. And you can see kind of a natural magenta color of the cloud in the little region we're looking at. And the stars, they're about 2 million years old. So that's 2 million seems like a long time, 2 million years. The sun is 10 billion years old. So 2 million years is nothing. These are baby stars still clustered together, still surrounded by the nebula that they just formed in. All right, 26th anniversary, the Bubble Nebula. Again, we're looking at a larger region, uh, fluorescent hydrogen. 
and uh, um, a baby stars inside of it. This is an especially massive star, about 40 times the mass of the sun. It is so massive that the wind that it's blowing out into space, the gases that it's blowing off of its surface, are actually plowing through the nebula that it's in and carving out this bubble surrounding it. It's also moving through space, which is why it's off center from the, from the bubble a little bit. Also, maybe because it's thicker over here, it might cause it to pile up a little bit, move a little bit slower over here. But this is a high mass star uh, blowing this bubble of stuff around, around it, uh, carving out a bubble inside the larger nebula it's a part of. It's a false color picture. Again, you, the real color would be kind of a magenta color. There's kind of a, a recoloring of what it might look like uh, if, if we had big enough eyes and could see the real color coming from it. All right, we're getting closer to 30. There's the 27th anniversary pair of galaxies, NGC, the new general catalog. Um, thousands of objects in this catalog of galaxies and nebulae and deep sky stuff. This is cool because you get two galaxies close together. Um, let's see, they're about uh, 55 million light years away. Um, they're both smaller than the Milky Way. You don't really see that they're interacting, but they are you know, out there the same distance away. Um, you get one looking kind of face on, see the spiral there, another one edge on, but they might have similar shapes if we could see them from similar perspectives. They're both inside, they are in the middle of a cluster of galaxies, not a cluster of stars, but a cluster of galaxies, the Virgo cluster of galaxies uh, about 55 million light years away. There's about 2,000 galaxies in that cluster. There's two of them. Oh yeah, and infrared again. If we go back and forth. You can see different features with the infrared. And again, that's what the James Webb Space Telescope will only be looking at exclusively infrared light. It'll still take gorgeous pictures. If you look at, you know, you look at the Hubble picture, it's a little bit different from the visual light picture, but it's not wildly different. It's so the new James Webb will also produce gorgeous photographs, and hopefully we'll be celebrating anniversaries of the James Webb um, with gorgeous photographs from it. Hopefully launching next year. All right, 28th anniversary. The Lagoon Nebula, uh, just a region of it. In fact, we're looking at the region where the uh, biggest, hottest, brightest star is. You can see the brightest glow here, this little part of the Lagoon Nebula. The nebula is about 5,000 light years away. So about almost uh, three, four times farther away than the, Ori than the Orion Nebula. But like the Orion, you can see this with the naked eye uh, here in Illinois. You got it into a dark sky. For example, Jubilee Park, uh, just 15 minutes outside of Peoria. And you can see this in the summertime. You can see the Orion Nebula in the wintertime. You can see the Lagoon Nebula in the summertime. And there's the beautiful magenta color. You won't see, you'll see just a gray, but if we had big enough eyes, we could see that beautiful magenta color. And again, we get uh, infrared. So switch back and forth from the visible to the infrared for the lagoon. All right, this was last year's anniversary picture. So you might remember we saw the Crab Nebula earlier. This is nicknamed the Southern Crab Nebula. As you can imagine these are pinchers. This is a really cool dynamic thing we're looking at. Looks like a dying star, kind of, like when it blows its gases out. Um, it's actually, it's a star that's already died. There's a dead star in there called a white dwarf. That's what the sun is going to turn into. And there's another star that's in the, that's getting really big. It's running out of nuclear fuel. It's become a red giant, but it hasn't died yet. But the two are interacting in such a way that gas gets pulled off of the big one onto the small dead one. And as it builds up stuff, Again, the magnetic force fields kind of blow that gas out. The reason we don't see it going into all directions is because of uh, the dust that's swirling around the dead star that's already there. So you don't see any stuff flying out over here or over here because the other dust is blocking it. We just see it going out essentially the North Pole and the South Pole, if you will. 
a really cool dynamic system and more distant blobs of gas that must have been expelled in even earlier explosions and newer stuff that's just being expelled right now that's making that hourglass, hourglass shape close to those dying stars or close to the one dead star and the one bloated star that will eventually turn into a dead star. All right, now the last, the last oh, sorry, uh, there's the false color pictures. So yeah, color coded, useful for scientists. You still get a pretty picture. You just don't get what would it look like to, to you know, if I could, if I had a big enough eyeball, what, what colors would I see? But at least you can see something useful there. All right, now here is the picture. If you haven't seen it, this is the one that came out today. The 30th anniversary just released this morning. They nicknamed it the Cosmic Reef. Um, we're seeing another false color picture of a nebula where stars have been forming and the stars are now lighting up the cloud. And this, by the way, is also in, oh, by the way, so we've got the cloud, we've got clusters of stars inside the cloud, lighting it up, going out of cavity. We've also got this other star that has formed. It's a young star. It's a very massive star. And it's similar to the bubble nebula we saw a couple of pictures back, where that star is blowing off so much gas, it's make, carving out a bubble. Well, this is uh, sim doing a similar thing. It's blowing off gas at a furious rate, carving out a bubble around it. There you can see a smaller view of a natural color picture, the, the hydrogen gas and, and oxygen that's getting blown out, glowing kind of blue there. This is like the Tarantula Nebula. It's in our neighbor satellite galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud, about 160,000 light years away. The big one is the Tarantula Nebula. We saw part of that earlier. And here's the little space where the new Hubble photograph is. You can see there, there's lots of these glowing clouds in the Magellanic Cloud. It would take many, many years for, if we wanted to photograph all of them up close with, with the Hubble. Um, lots, of, lots of space out there, lots of sky to look at. The Hubble is just zooming in on these little tiny pieces. And every time it does so, we get to see some new marvelous thing up close, better than we've ever seen it before. There's a little bit of a zoom out now where you can see the Milky Way going across the sky. And if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you can see the large Magellanic Cloud. And of course, there's also a small Magellanic Cloud. So that's the new picture. By the way, if you want more Hubble in just five minutes at seven o'clock, if you go to nasa.gov and then you can click on NASA TV there, they're going to have a cool documentary on the 30th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. So check out nasa.gov and NASA TV, and you can watch a cool NASA produced program about the Hubble Space Telescope. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the tour of just a few of the Hubble pictures. Lots more if you go to their the website, nasa.gov, click on the Hubble, or go straight to Hubble site, and you can spend hours, days, weeks looking at incredible, beautiful, pictures of the universe and learning a whole bunch about all the cool stuff happening out there in the universe. So thanks for tuning in and I don't know if anybody's got any questions or if we're all done or. Yeah, yeah guys, if you have any questions, I know we have about 30 people or so watching. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to post them in the comments and we'd be more than happy to answer them. I actually have a question for you, Nick. What is your favorite Hubble photo? I will say the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Actually, though, the, the one that had the biggest impact on me was the first Hubble, Hubble Deep Field. Um, let me see if I can go back to it real quick. And I, did, I saw it for the first time in college when I took uh, astronomy, which is why I'm doing this here today right now. Um, yeah, I was, we didn't, I was looking through my uh, textbook and looking towards the back at you know, intergalactic space and I saw this photograph and it was incredible couldn't believe it. And so I would drive around for a while. I would drive around town with the book open to that page, looking at it and thinking about it because it's just incredible. And it was completely oblivious uh, to me um, before that. So uh, that one, but I like the higher quality, more recent ultra deep field the best. What's your favorite? That one, mainly because um... 
it's just a stunning, like you, I find looking at the Hubble Deep Field one to be the most beautiful and majestic experiences just to know you're looking at hundreds upon hundreds of galaxies, each with or with thousands or excuse me, billions, if not trillions of own stars with their own planets. You know, Carl Sagan always talked about the idea of billions and billions and they just get the impact of of how ginormous our universe truly is when you see a photo like this. So definitely the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This photo was also taken on my birthday, um, August 29th. <laughs> um, you can actually go on a website. NASA just posted a website a couple days ago. If you type in your birthday, you can actually see what photo Hubble took on your birthday. So on Hubble's birthday, Hubble's giving you gifts of your birthday. So thank you, Hubble. Yeah, that, wow, that's awesome. What, a, what an extra bonus. Yeah. <laughs> For you. <laughs> so if we have any more, any questions uh, one last time, uh, please feel free to ask them. Um, but if not, I think that's gonna wrap things up here. Thank you so much, Nick. That was an absolutely fantastic presentation. That was so interesting and really exciting to watch. I hope you guys who are watching learned so much. Um, and again, a quick shout out to our Visionary Society as well as our members. You guys are awesome. And without the support you guys have been giving, to the museum, the content we have been producing simply would not be possible. So thank you guys so much. You guys are the best and yeah.